too little early is really bad. Patients die quick. Yep. Too much is bad long term. Patients don't do well. Yeah. So you got to get the fluid just right. Hi, this is Nicole Kupchik and welcome to 10 Minute Tidbits. Today, I'm here with Nick Johnson and we are going to chat about fluids. So the big question, when do you stop giving fluids, especially in a patient who's hypotensive? We're going to hone in on sepsis though, right? Yeah, let's focus on sepsis today. Okay, because first line of treatment, sepsis, IV antibiotics, give yeah. some fluid. Yeah, and you know, all of our guidelines say right now that 30 mLs per kilo is what we should be using to resuscitate patients initially. but uh, where that comes from and where that's going is not really clear. Yeah, I always kind of joke around and say it came from back here, the backside, right? <laughs> yeah, something like that. I think if you actually look at the surviving sepsis yeah. guidelines where they make the reference, they reference the old surviving sepsis guidelines. But if you go back a couple of generations, uh, they actually reference some of the, the <laughs> early gold directed therapy trials. Yeah. But that was sort of the average amount that people happened to get. Yes. Um, and because it was the average amount that people happened to get, they figured it was reasonable. That's what most people were doing, and that's where they settled on this 30 mLs per kilo. But it's not really based on anything more than that. And I don't think we really know. Yeah, so, so okay, bottom line. You slam a patient with fluid. What do you want to know? Yeah, so I think there are two things I want to know. Okay. One is, are they getting better? Is their cardiac output improving? Is their uh, organ perfusion improving? Okay. And the other is, am I hurting them? Um, Ooh, are they yes. having any signs of not tolerating that fluid? Are they developing pulmonary edema? Yes. Is their kidney function getting worse? Is their heart getting worse? So it's a, it's a combination of are they improving, are they yes. responding, and are they tolerating fluid? Okay, and I think that's a really good point because I mean, so often we, we slam a patient with fluid and we're like, what's the blood pressure? What's the heart rate? And the heart rate and blood pressure are terrible predictors of fluid responsiveness. Absolutely. Yeah, so we pr we probably need some sort of a stroke volume measure. Yeah, I think that's patients. probably right. I think we prob the pro probably the right answer is we need to individualize it to the patient. Um, I think there are some studies that are showing that uh, fluid liberal strategy, giving a lot of fluid up front, is actually associated with harm. So there is a small randomized trial in Europe called the Classic Trial that randomized patients to a fluid bolus versus kind of a conservative fluid strategy early on. And they found that more patients in the fluid bolus strategy actually got, had, had acute kidney injury, which is the opposite of what yeah. we would expect. Wait, but what type of fluid were they using? Do you remember? They were chance? using balanced fluids. Oh, study. they were? Yeah. Okay. Because that's one of the, the concerns we have is if you're using saline, there might be some chloride mediated acute kidney injury. Totally. Okay. And then there's all this observational data showing that fluid balance at 24 hours, 48 hours, pick a time period in the ICU, that a positive fluid balance is associated with worse outcome compared to patients who have an even or a negative fluid balance, which of course is terribly confounded. Sicker patients get more fluid, sicker yes. patients pee less, so it's really hard to know what to make of those data. But there's definitely this signal that everyone's worried about that maybe more fluid is not a good thing. Yeah, well, and, um, and Harborview had published a retrospective study a few years ago showing that if, when patients did have a f positive fluid balance coming out of the ICU, they were more likely to need rehab. Yeah. Uh, down the line and so um, and they found a lot of times de-resuscitation or getting fluid off wasn't started until outside of the ICU. Absolutely I think being aggressive on the back end you know starting with the fact mm -hmm. trial which was that PA catheter versus central line and liberal fluid versus conservative fluid trial from the ARDSnet uh, really shows that taking fluid off on the back end helps get people off the ventilator and probably helps people move along in their care even yeah. more. One weird thing they found in that trial though is that the fluid liberal group had better long-term neurocognitive outcomes. So maybe there's some things about giving fluid, brain perfusion and other things yeah. that we don't really understand very well. And, and I think we just have no idea what the strategy is at this point. Yeah, and um, so, okay, so we're, we're uh, I think everyone's probably in agreement that like the Michelin man, Michelin woman is not a good strategy. Agreed. So what should you do at the bedside, right? So you, you, let's say you've got a patient, it's two in the morning. Always two in the morning, right? Always two in the morning. Always two in yep. the morning. When bad stuff happens. Yes, when really bad stuff happens. Yep. So two in the morning, you've got a patient who's hypotensive, they're septic. W what should we do at the bedside? Yeah. So some str easy strategies. I think the first thing I do is, based on what I know about the patient, just the patient's me medical history, what they're there for, what mm -hmm. they've gotten so far, I do a little mental risk-benefit equation before I do any testing or any okay. type of monitoring. And the risk-benefit is how likely do I think it is this patient's going to uh, get better with fluid? And how likely do I think it is I'm going to hurt this patient with fluid? Okay. And depending on that, I'll think about what I need to do next. 
if it's very likely that the patient would benefit. They look super dry. Their story is they've been having vomiting and diarrhea for the past week, uh, and they have, they're have they 20 years old, have a normal heart, normal lungs. I'm probably just going to give that patient fluid. I'm not okay. going to think about it too much. The flip side is if I have an 85-year-old patient with end-stage renal disease and heart failure, and there's a high likelihood that they're going to be harmed by fluid, and I'm not really sure uh, whether or not they need it, that's a patient where I might do an ultrasound or put them on an advanced hemodynamic monitor, give them a small test bolus, see how they respond, yeah. and see if their hemodynamics improve. And if they do, I would consider giving more fluid. What are your thoughts? Now, I've done this quite a bit at the bedside of um, doing the passive leg raise test with capnography to yeah. assess if the patient will be fluid responsive. I think there's one kind of cool paper showing that uh, it actually does predict fluid responsiveness decently yeah. well in certain patients. Is that uh, Xavier Monet's paper? Yeah, this yeah. is Monet's paper. Yeah. It has to be a closed system, intubated patients, uh, all the usual caveats about um, you know tidal volume being fixed, patient not interacting with the ventilator, yeah. all the other variables sort of have to be taken out of the picture, and those patients are hard to find in the ICU. But in that very narrow patient population, I think it can be one test that is useful. Uh, remember, one of the things that end tidal CO2 is just a marker of cardiac output, how much blood is being brought yes. back to the lungs. And so it's, if that data point makes sense with all your other data points, I think it's a nice tool to use and it's usually available in, at the bedside yeah. already. Well, and then one of the questions we're asking is, is it time for facilities to invest in maybe non-invasive stroke volume measurements? I mean, I, I personally think it's time. Yeah, I think so. I think that there are a lot of devices out there. Mm -hmm. um, that one challenge is there's not a lot of uh, devices that have been studied really rigorously yeah. yet. Mm -hmm. There's some trials and studies that are kind of upcoming. Um, but I think the limitation right now is that people don't necessarily know how to integrate those things into practice because yes. there's not a lot of data yet. Yeah. Um, well, and I think the key thing is if you're going to use a device that um, that you have some sort of a, either a nurse-driven protocol or uh, just a protocol that kind of helps guide. And I'm not saying a protocol in, in the sense of like, you have to do this. But I think a protocol that helps guide, especially like two in the morning, you know, what do you do if you get this number? What do you do if you get that number? Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's true for any of these hemodynamic monitoring tools is they're really dynamic. They should be used not necessarily obtaining a static measurement than walking away for 48 hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you really need to have a plan where you're going to measure some variable, do some maneuver, and see if that variable changes, and then yeah. do that over and over and over again. And I think for all these devices, the key theme is the trend is way more important than the absolute numbers. Yeah. Uh, and so one absolute number in isolation really doesn't mean very much. Yeah, in which direction are they heading with your therapy? Absolutely. Yeah, so all right. All right, any other thoughts on fluid? So we, we uh, everyone agrees too little early is really bad, patients die quick. Yeah. Too much is bad long term, patients don't do well. Yeah. So you gotta get the fluid just right. Yeah. Um, I think a couple other interesting things, uh, everyone's concerned about sepsis bundles right now okay. and where this 30 ml per kilo thing fits in into the practice. I think for now, it's a part of the CMS bundle. We need to follow the bundle so that our yeah. hospitals are uh, getting credit for that. Um, but interestingly, when they implemented a sepsis bundle in New York State in this big study by Chris Seymour, uh, things that you'd think would uh, be associated with outcome were, so time to antibiotics associated with uh, improved outcome. Uh, the whole bundle itself associated with improved outcome. Time to completion of the fluid bolus, no association with improved outcome. So not necessarily sure that when you apply this strategy to populations of people, it's the right thing. Um, the other uh, kind of interesting thing about the, uh, about the state of fluids right now is there are a couple of big trials ongoing that might give us some answers. Uh, the one that I'm involved with is through the PEDAL network, which is the new ARDSnet, and it's a, it's a study called CLOVERS, looking at a liberal fluid strategy versus a restrictive fluid strategy in patients with um, infection and hypotension. So hopefully in the next three or four years, we'll have some more big trials to inform us about what that right strategy is for those first yeah. 24 hours in sepsis. Yeah, and then maybe you can integrate tools to help get you there. Absolutely. A little, you know, yeah, I, I think we're going to get there, but it's I just think now we're kind of in this, this uh, kind of middle kind of gray area zone right now yep. where we know we need to stop using heart rate and blood pressure as a marker of what to do but don't really exactly have a clear kind of clear path of how to use technology either right i think we're gonna get there though i think so too yeah i'm, I'm optimistic so. i'm yeah. totally optimistic so all right well i'm nicole kopchik this is nick johnson and this is 10 minute tidbits